Well, friends, and just like that, this engine is officially ready to be mated up to the transmission and put back in that car. You guys, I hope you're doing well. I don't even, I can't even stick to my script right now because I'm so psyched out of my freaking gourd. First of all, welcome to Funhead TV. Second of all, let me tell you what the heck we're gonna be working on today while you're looking at it. That's it. Am I excited? Am I getting Italian hands about it? Yup, yup, stay tuned. So if you've missed the previous content on this car, again, please go back and watch it. But just as a little refresher, this engine right here is out of my 2001 Porsche 911 Carrera 4. This, as it sits, is not a stock M96 engine. Originally, it was a 3.4 liter, now a 3.8 liter. I do track this car, uh, and I want, for all intents and purposes, a bulletproof engine. Hence the term Project Beef, because we are beefing this engine up to the full extent of the term making this the most beefy M96 911 on the planet so that it can handle all of the track work that we can possibly throw at it. Everything that you're seeing right now, we put all this together in the last episode. We did that at the machine shop in Charlotte, North Carolina with my good buddy, Elon. He is a machinist expert slash car enthusiast slash Porsche enthusiast slash all around great guy. So we got it up to the point of what you are looking at currently. Basically, rotating assembly is completely toleranced clearance, good to go. Brand new JE pistons installed into the brand new Ellen Engineering Nicosil Nikki's cylinders. And then we finished off by throwing on the freshly refurbished cylinder heads. So this puppy is good to go, ready to be assembled the rest of the way. It's time to go ahead and begin putting this thing back together, which is super exciting. Obviously, as you can see, we do have the cylinder heads on the engine, but there is nothing inside of these cylinder heads. All right, now, first order of business is going to be throwing the oil pump back on. Let me explain why. Now, currently the oil pump is not in place and that's a problem because one of the sides of the intermediate shaft is held, here's the intermediate shaft, is held by the oil pump. And in fact, the oil pump is driven by this side of the intermediate shaft. So as you can see, I can like move it with my hand. Now we're gonna want the oil pump in place so that we can secure that end of the intermediate shaft so we don't get any kind of like chain binding or anything like that. We need everything having to do with timing chains and anything that controls timing chains to be locked exactly dead nuts in place in order to put all of this in time. Otherwise, it's not gonna truly be in time because the moment we secure a thing that's unsecured, well, then it's gonna turn it and get it, you know, a certain number of degrees off. All right, here we are back in the workshop area. Here's our oil pump slash, you know, coolant jacket. I'm gonna be swapping out a lot of parts with regards to this thing, so here's the old uh, oil pump o-ring we have a new one of those we also have a new upper coolant jacket gasket that goes right here we have two brand new o-rings to go in place those go where the oil pump goes on around the intermediate shaft we also have a brand new oil pressure relief valve here's the old one basically it just consists of a piston and a spring that goes up in this part of the oil pump right here and let's see here's a new spring and then our new piston is right here one thing that's pretty interesting, however, with regards to that oil pressure relief valve, check this out really quick. So we've got our old spring on the left, new spring on the right. The new spring looks to be a little bit thicker and it's definitely taller. So either this is a new spring spec or the old one was just so worn out that it's just now kind of more naturally compressed, which is very possible. But this one definitely feels quite a bit stiffer when you just try to compress it by hand. Hopefully that's a good sign that maybe we'll be able to maintain some more oil pressure throughout our entire oil system. Not like we really needed it, but you know, whatever. I'll take some more oil pressure, it's all good. Okay, well I'm gonna go ahead and throw this together. I will show you guys what I did once I got it done. Alrighty, now I've got the oil pump mostly reassembled. Um, I just have the uh, top of the oil pump just kind of like snugged down uh, with the new gasket in place. Um, and then on the back, course we've got our new o-rings that are going to seal around the part of the case halves where the oil pump mates up with the intermediate shaft also this hex drive right here is extremely important make sure that before you put your oil pump back in place that that is there because if it's not then your oil pump is not going to turn and you're going to have zero oil pressure and you'll have to take it all back apart bad news bears just make sure that little hex key is there okay okay now back over at the engine we are going to have to do a couple things before we actually install uh, the oil pump one of those 
to do is we have to get those studs put back in place that go in four different spots and those just go into the block. These are literally what the engine mount mounts to. So obviously these are pretty critical. So we can do those easy peasy. But before we put the pump back on, we need to make sure that we have our timing chain guides in place, which mount uh, to these holes right here. Why? Because the oil pump covers these up. Got to do that first and foremost, and then we can go ahead and put our oil pump on. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them down below in the comments. All right, finally, we got the oil pump and related hardware tightened down in place and torqued. We can officially say that the intermediate shaft is well, at least secured on this end. And then I did go ahead and put in the timing chain tensioner for the intermediate shafts as well, meaning that it is officially, officially good to go and good to be you know, taut if we were to rotate the engine. But anyway, good news everyone, because we are officially at the point of being able to start putting together the cylinder heads. Well, it is now what some people might refer to as the next morning. And we're back working on my M96 engine. So today's goal is to get both of the cylinder heads fully reassembled. I want the cams, lifter carrier, lifters, all of it timed and assembled, good to go. So we have a lot to do. So let's just go ahead and start getting into it. Back here on my table O stuff, uh, you can see all the parts that go into each cylinder head. But let me just go over what we got going on. So. These are the original chains right here that connected the two cams um, for each bank. This is a five chain engine. Uh, I have two brand new chains ready to go in this engine. Boom. There's our new chain for bank one. Bank two's chain is right there. We also have a replacement of the Vario cam pads. Um, these are only a couple years old and don't have that many miles on them, but I just figured while we're in there, might as well. These were showing just a little bit of wear. As you can see, you can, you can tell where the chain was running. So. Obviously, that's not a big deal. These have a ton of life left in them, but nonetheless, hey, we've got them out. We might as well just throw some brand new ones back in this puppy anyway. Uh, we have brand new lifters that are gonna go back in this lifter carrier. Those are sitting, soaking in oil, have been for about the last 24 hours. Obviously, we've got brand new primary timing chain guides going back in as well. I already installed the other ones into bank two because we needed to have the, uh, those in place before we put the oil pump up in place. So I do need to go ahead and clean everything. This has all been sitting out for the past few months just on this table. I didn't cover any of it up, so it's a little bit dusty. And of course it's still oil covered from when it was in the engine. So oil attracts dust. I need to go ahead and just kind of clean all this crap off real quick before we put it up in for real, real. So I won't bore you guys with the cleaning process, but I'm just going to do that for a little bit here. And then in the next frame of this video, we'll go ahead and just start putting one of the cylinder heads together. Let's do it. Okay. Well, I just completed the pretty unexciting task of going ahead and just cleaning all the major components. I got the cams cleaned up, the lifter carriers cleaned up for each bank, primary drive sprockets, you name it. Oh, the Vario cam solenoids. I went ahead and swapped over uh, the the old Varicam pads with the new Varicam pads. As you can see, we got some freshies sitting on these now. Uh, so now that all the cleaning is done, we can officially move on to putting things together. And one of the next major phases basically is reassembling the cams. Uh, and what I mean by that is we need to put the Varicam solenoid back in between the cams uh, with our brand new um, cam chains. This is kind of a little bit of a tricky procedure. It requires a little bit of patience, uh, but I'll talk you guys through it. So no worries. First of all, and foremost of all, uh, we do need to know exactly how to put these cams in time with one another. And you do that by first identifying, um, the dots on the sprockets of the cams. So you can see that this intake cam here has this, this dot right there. And then the exhaust one also has a dot right there. I hope you can see that. All right. Once you have identified those, you then need to put those exactly eight links apart on the chain. It depends on how you count it really, but you can see on this old chain that it has uh, lighter links that identify exactly where those uh, points on the sprockets go. So if you count them, they are eight links apart. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What I did there was I counted the first link. I, if you count it as in the first one being a first step, then it's seven. Does that make sense? I'm counting the end link. Okay. With that in mind, we need to look at our new chain here. The aftermarket chains do not have the lighter links on them to identify where they need to go. So we need to be very careful 
uh, that we don't mess this up. With that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and take my Sharpie here and we're gonna mark exactly where those links are. Keep in mind, you can write all over the inside of an engine. If you didn't see uh, in the machine shop video, Elon and I were writing on pistons, on case halves, etc., just to like make notes. Otherwise, you know, you forget stuff. Here we go. We're gonna just arbitrarily pick this link right here. Boom, that's our first link. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's do this again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, double checked and triple checked. Let's go ahead and line these marks up with the old chain. Yep, and as you can see, our new marks line up with the light links on the old chain. We're good there. We can kind of set the old chain aside for now. I'm gonna go ahead and do this on, on the other new chain just while we're at it. I know it seems like I'm being obsessive compulsive, but this is a very critical step. So obviously I don't wanna get this wrong uh, because if we have our um, cams a tooth out from one another, then the engine is going to run like absolute crap. We're gonna to have to take it all back apart and put it in time. So it might be kind of hard to see here, but hopefully you can see that our dimples on the sprockets line up perfectly with the marks on our chain. The cams are in time with one another. Okay, now that we have our cams lined up with one another, we can kind of just set these cams aside just for a short bit here while we take care of some other business. All right, I'm just gonna set those over there. We need to compress our Variocam solenoid. This is a very, very critical component of this job because the Variocam solenoid has a serious spring and both sides of it need to be compressed you know, just so in order to get them to fit between the two cams. So in order to do that, you have to take what's called Porsche Special Tool 9632, and that is this device right here. So we've got it threaded into the one side, and these are reverse threaded, left hand threaded. I sell these on my website, by the way, funaheadtv.com. So if you're doing this project and you need one of these, feel free to head on over to uh, funaheadtv.com and pick up one for yourself. All right, so we're just gonna go ahead and thread this down just so you know, it's very obvious when you can no longer thread this thing down. Um, these do have a definite stopping point. So once you reach that, do not keep turning it because you could possibly damage your Variocam solenoid. All right, now it is time to go ahead and put our Variocam solenoid in between the cams. This is the part that definitely takes some finagling. So let's go ahead and double check that our uh, marked sprockets are lined up with the dimples on the cams, and they are. Good, good. <sighs> okay, so we have our Variocam solenoid nicely compressed. Sometimes the guides don't really love to stay in place, but the good news is um, once we have them between the cams, they can't go anywhere. And then the key here is, so you can see I got the bottom part, the key is to have the cams up. Okay, we're still lined up. Good, good. We have to have them in the air. And then, boom. Now that we've got it back in, okay, yep, our marks are still lining up, boom. We have our Variocam solenoid installed. What we wanna do is go ahead and leave our Special Tool 9632 installed into the Variocam solenoid because it will make installing the cams about a million times easier. Otherwise, you have a serious amount of spring force pushing back on this uh, chain, which wants to pull the cams together the whole time that you're trying to install them. Um, and I, I guess I did Bank two's first, so we're gonna go ahead and install bank two. In all honesty, it does not matter uh, which bank you start with. So let's go ahead and uh, start installing things such as the lifter carrier into bank two to get it prepared for reassembly. All right, now off camera, I went ahead and just kind of wiped everything up, gave it one last good wipe down. You know what I mean? So I think we're officially good to go. It is time to start putting some assembly lube up in our cylinder head here. So I'm gonna go ahead and use this red line assembly lube. This is the good stuff in case you were wondering. Oh my gosh, this stuff smells so good. This video is brought to you by Redline, by the way. Redline makes some fantastic products for just about anything you would need to do on your car ever. Any kind of fluid from engine oil, obviously, to automatic transmission fluid, to gear oil, to brake fluid, I mean, you name it. If you need any fluids for your car and you're not using Redline yet, psh, what are you doing? Go check out their website and, uh, you know, see what all they have to offer. I'm still running that deal, by the way, that I mentioned in uh, one of my last videos. I'm gonna be throwing in a free Redline t-shirt and a bottle of Redline's water wetter into three random orders. So if you're on the fence at all about ordering some uh, Fun Ahead TV merch, then uh, you know now's the time to do it while I'm doing this promo. You get an additional t-shirt and some delicious water wetter, which is a fantastic product, by the way. 
add that to your cooling system and uh, it really helps to keep temperatures down especially if you live in a hot environment or you do a lot, a lot of towing. So obviously, as you can see, I'm just kind of going in with some of this assembly lube, getting in where the lifters are gonna go, uh, just to kind of pre-lubricate those. So we definitely wanna make sure everything is lubricated before we get oil pressure throughout the entire engine. Also, the cylinder heads for the M96, M97 engines do have the journals for the camshafts integrated into the cylinder heads, so that's what I'm lubing up now. By the way, if you've ever worked on one of these engines before, what's your favorite method for holding up the timing chains? As you can see, I like using the old super retro screwdriver method. It's like Thomas Jefferson once said, if you're not using an old wood handled screwdriver to hold up your M96 timing chains, then what are, what are you doing? You know, I think that's, I think that's what he said. Just an ultra quick note before we throw the cams in, I do wanna make note that I did go ahead and line up the crankshaft to the U6 position. Uh, and I'll explain more about that in a second. Uh, this has to basically do with getting the uh, timing chains taut and seated as we fully put this engine in time, at least this bank in time. All right, now next up, I'm gonna go ahead and take my bucket of oiled lifters here. This is gonna be very oily. It's time to put the oiled lifters up in place. Obviously everything is just loosely sitting here right now, but you can see what I mean about uh, keeping the Porsche Special Tool 9632 installed because otherwise the Variocam solenoid will be pulling the cams up and out of place right now and they are nicely seated uh, down in their places currently. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep these loose just for a second uh, and I mentioned that we're at currently at U6. We will turn it from uh, U6 to OT. That kind of removes any slack from it. So in order to do that, you can see that there's uh, slots in this sprocket. In order to do that, we're gonna have to account for that turn. So we need to make sure that the holes on this sprocket are lined up to, with about as far right as possible in this slot so that when we go ahead and turn this, it lines up somewhere in the middle. That'll make more sense when we do it, but I just wanna like let you guys know what I'm doing for now, just so that you can have it in the back of your minds. What I'm gonna go ahead and do is kinda of get the cams secured. Uh, and in order to do that, I, I do need to go ahead and put a couple sp uh, Porsche special tools in place. I'll show you what those are in just a second here. We are, we're also gonna put our main bearing caps in place, not main bearings, but like, you know, the, the primary bearing caps uh, in place for the cams. But because there's only one set of actual bearing caps, uh, and as you can see, we have the rest of the cams just kind of hanging free, we do need to have a special tool that holds the cams down just so we're not putting excessive torque um, on those caps. So I'll show you what those are now. All right, here's that special tool. It's basically just a block that mimics the valve cover so that it can hold this end down uh, without actually having the cam cover in place. One thing that's kind of cool is the bolts for the coil packs work perfectly for this application. Um, the normal um, valve cover bolts are not long enough. Okay, go back together with our uh, bearing caps really quickly. There are two bearing caps. So the bearing caps are marked with A7407 and E7407. 7407 is the number of the cylinder head. When you look at the cylinder head on the bottom left of it, there is a number stamped into it, and that is this cylinder head, 7407, 7407. You need to make sure when you're grabbing your bearing caps that they match the cylinder head that they're going into. Otherwise, they're incorrect because they are align honed specifically for the cylinder head and for the bearing application. And you can tell which one is which by the letter. So E actually stands for intake. That is not exhaust, it's intake because German. And A is exhaust. So we need to put the E bearing cap up on the intake. And they are thrust bearings as well, so they you know, need to line up this way just right. I forgot to put assembly lube in these. Whoops. And because, like I said, they are thrust bearings, so I went ahead and put some assembly lube on either side of the bearings as well. Now I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of snug these up. I'm not gonna tighten these down super tight just yet, 
The whole point of this is to just kind of have the cams in place. It is a process that requires quite a bit of patience, so be patient. Don't try to rush it. You don't want to go damaging anything or skip a step and then have the engine completely out of time. Um, so I went ahead and took out our Porsche Special Tool 9632, aka the Swizzle, as the cool kids call it. Again, these are for sale on my website, funaheadtv.com. Uh, if you do need one, go ahead and pick one up. They're uh, super nice to have. Let me get you guys in here and we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail. Okay, so looking at this side, you can see what I mean a little bit better now. So when we turn the crank from uh, U6 to the o OT position, it's, we're gonna have to turn the crank about that much. And as you can see, obviously this sprocket, which is not connected to the cam right now, it's just sitting on the cam, is going to turn as well. And that it means by that time this turns, these holes on the cam sprocket are gonna be somewhere in the middle of this slot, which will be perfect. While we're here, let's go ahead and just double check. Here's our uh, marked link, and then here's the dimple on the cam sprocket. And then, well, you guys might not be able to see this one, but same deal over here. So we're still in alignment over here. Just wanna go ahead and double check that, obviously, because if we get all this put together and realize these are out of phase with one another, then that is bad news freaking bears. And then when we go ahead and look on this side, uh, you can see that this surface here, these notches are completely flush with the surface of the cylinder head. And that's what we want. That's what shows that our exhaust cam is lined up. And actually the way that this works is, at least with regards to the VarioCam F1 generation of VarioCam, the, the exhaust cam is what is lined up to the crank. This VarioCam solenoid moves and then changes the proximity or the phasing uh, relative to the exhaust cam. So we're, we're actually not gonna be lining up the intake cam at all. We only line up the exhaust cam. So in a second here, we'll go ahead and throw on the special tool that allows us to uh, line up these cams. But first we do need to go ahead and torque everything down. Uh, all these go to 10 Newton meters, I believe. The, the bearing caps and the VarioCam bolts. So we have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bolts that we need to go ahead and snug up. Uh, and then that is it. We will be ready to go ahead and throw the valve cover on the engine from there. All right, I got the engine turned back up vertically again because we're about to set the valve cover over this. Now I did a few things off camera just now. I went ahead and torqued up our bearing caps to 10 Newton meters. Went ahead and did the same thing to our VarioCam solenoid. Got that torqued down as well, 10 Newton meters. Also, as you can see, I went ahead and put on uh, Loctite 5900 on this entire flange. Uh, of course, before doing that, I took some brake clean on a rag, wiped the entire flange down to make sure we don't have any amount of oil on it. I also did the same thing on the flip side of the valve cover, got that flange nice and cleaned up. I also went ahead and threw some uh, red line assembly lube inside of the uh, journals for the cams. So we should be pretty good to go. Oh, and also I forgot the, uh, the elephant in the room here. This is a Porsche special tool that allows for the cams, this side of the cams to be held down once we remove our big block unit here. Uh, so therefore we're not putting any amount of excessive torque on our uh, bearing caps here. Just one last quick look at our Loctite 5900 job before we seal up the valve cover for good. Notice in the middle, we wanna seal up the holes, but stay away from the bearings. Stay away from the bearings. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and grab the torque wrench. We'll get this thing torqued down now, and then we can officially put the engine in time, which is super duper freaking exciting. I put the special tool in place that locks the cams in place and puts them in the exact location that they need to be uh, in order to time the engine. So now we get back to what I was talking about a while ago with regards to you know the, the crank position of U6 and 0T. That is now gonna come into play. So what I have done is I have already put the timing chain tensioner in place for uh, the primary timing chain. This sprocket here is still not tightened down to the camshaft. As you can see, there are, there's nothing holding it whatsoever. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is go ahead and turn the crank. That way the chain has a little bit of time to, to turn and kind of seat itself in. In addition, because it's just put under tension, you know, maybe it hasn't quite centered itself in the guides. Basically, I should have just said that. We're trying to take out slack by this little bit of crank movement. So we're gonna go ahead and turn the crank into the zero T position. We're gonna lock the crank with another special tool, that pin right there. And then once the crank's locked, we have the cams locked, we can go ahead 
and, and secure that sprocket. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn our crank into the top dead center position, AKA the zero T position. And I want you guys to watch what happens on the cam sprocket as we do that. What, what's that? Okay, we've got our crank at the zero T position. I just went ahead and locked it with our crank lock. So that is officially in place. Our cam sprocket is officially in place. Now we can put our bolts into the camshaft and lock this sprocket for good. The engine will be in time. Super exciting. All right, now time to put these cam sprocket bolts up in place. I like to hit these bolts with a little bit of blue Loctite in an effort to just prevent them from backing out at all, considering this sprocket literally is responsible for keeping our engine in time. Now the torque spec on these particular bolts is 10 Newton meters. I'm gonna go up to about 13 as a starting point. The exhaust cam flange that this sprocket is tightening to is steel. So it's not like we have a super high risk of stripping it out and it doesn't hurt to just kind of get it that little extra tightness, especially since these bolts literally, like I said, keep this engine in time. In fact, I might go up a couple more Newton meters, 15 Newton meters. Okay. All right, everybody there. Bank two is assembled and in time. Now we just have to go ahead and throw all the rest of the auxiliary stuff back in place, uh, such as the secondary oil pump, spark plug tubes, etc. And then this bank will officially be wrapped up and good to go. Alrighty, now one last thing that we need to do before calling this bank to for real, for real, done, done, is we need to turn this thing over just to make sure that everything is happy and spins freely and nothing is binding up or hitting valves, which would be the worst, worst case scenario. But also we need to turn the engine 360 degrees anyway, because this is very important to so listen. So we are currently in bank two's top dead center. In order to go to bank one's top dead center, we need to turn the crank 360 degrees. Let's pull this crank lock and we can go ahead and turn our engine over. Bank two is turning for the very first time. This is exciting. Okay, there is zero T. Well, successful 360 degree turn, everybody. Bank two is officially done. Boom. And just like that, a fully retimed, reassembled bank two cylinder head. We've got our brand new cam plugs, brand new spark plug tubes in place there, return oil pumps installed with a brand new O-ring. You guys, bank two cylinder head, check, check. Let's move on to bank one. I think I'm gonna go ahead and not film the reassembly of bank one because it's literally just a repeat of everything we did on bank two. The only exception, and that at least I can think of off the top of my head, is that when you're doing the step for the exhaust cam sprocket, instead of having the bolt holes for the cam sprocket line up on the far right side of the slot, they need to line up on the far left side of the slot when the crank is in U6. Does that make sense? Reason for that, of course, is, well, that sprocket is on the opposite side of the engine for bank one. So when you turn the crank this way, that sprocket moves this way instead of turning that way. I mean, it turns the same way, but it's on the opposite side of the engine. So that is all. Aside from that, it is gonna be the exact same thing on bank one as we did on bank two. I'm not gonna bore you guys with those details. I think we can go ahead and move on to other assembly items. Let's do it. Did you see that? We just finished up bank one. Bank one and bank two are now officially all in time and good to go. Well, actually almost good to go. We do still have one more check to do. And the people who have been around my channel for a while, drop it down in the comments if you know what it is. I'll give you five seconds. Do you know what it is? We've got to do a 720 check. That means we have to turn the crankshaft 720 degrees, one full cycle of this engine's valve opening, closing, in order to make sure that we truly have this engine in time 
and that no valves are meeting, in, meeting pistons. And this is especially important because we have brand new pistons in this engine that are higher compression, which means that they're inherently closer to the valves. So any amount of miscalculation on our part could obviously mean that valves are hitting pistons and that would be extremely, extremely bad. But not just the pistons though. Obviously we have decked both the case halves and the cylinder heads, which means that the distance between the top of the pistons and the dome of the cylinder head are closer to one another. So I've been stalling enough. Let's go ahead and turn this engine 720 degrees. All right, now I've gone ahead and taken all six spark plugs back out just so that we can more freely turn this engine. We'll go ahead and unlock our crankshaft. Go ahead and turn this. So we're at zero T right now. We need to do two full crank rotations in order for this engine to complete one entire cycle. That was one. Boom, and that was two. You guys, this engine's in time and it is cherry and good to go. I don't know why that always makes me so nervous doing that. I know I did it right, but doing that initial 720 check is just, it's a little bit nerve wracking because you just never know, you know? Especially with all this new hardware in the engine. So we have officially passed the 720 check and therefore we can move on to reassembling the rest of all the auxiliary things on the engine, which means once we get that done, the engine will literally be ready to go back up in that car right over there. Should we get to it? Or do you guys want to just like hold off, you know, like just wait a few weeks, you know, maybe go pick up a rotisserie chicken from Kroger, kick it, crack open a few uh, cold brewskis, sit on the back porch, enjoy the spring weather, nom on some rotisserie chicken with your six pack. Or do you guys want to go finish building an engine? I vote for that. Okay, let's go. All right, well, we've obviously been kind of chugging along here, as you can see. We've got a lot of the auxiliary items back on top of the engine. So we've made good progress so far. Although I just hit a minor road bump uh, and it actually works out pretty well because, uh, you know, since we've been chugging along, might as well check in with you guys. Here is what I found. Right over here uh, on this part of the wire harness, we've got the plug for battery monitor. You know, what the charging system is, or what the electrical system state is. So I noticed on this wire uh, that, the, that the insulation has a bit of a break in it. It's uh, pretty understandable that the uh, insulation on this wire would be uh, aging. Aging rubber and plastics. It's the name of the game of older cars as we've talked about so many times on this channel. I'm gonna cut this back a little bit so I can have a little bit more access to, to more of the wire's length. Uh, I'm gonna cut this and then we're gonna go ahead and um, put in place some uh, heat shrink so that we can protect this. I tried to depend this coupler just now and I can't seem to get a small enough tool to get in there and actually depend that. What I mean is I can actually take out the pin from this coupler uh, so that I can have better access to it. I'm just worried that the more I pull on this, the more I'm gonna risk actually breaking the wire right here and that would actually be a problem because then, then I wouldn't have you know, as much um, access as I, as I really need uh, in order to mend this wire. So obviously just depinning itself increases the risk that we do further damage and I think actually just cutting it a little bit down the wire is gonna be a better option. Okay, and a few minutes later, here is my handiwork here. 
Uh, it turned into like the worst solder ever because I was really trying not to let the heat travel down the wire where I had my heat shrink resting. Uh, if you've ever done this before and you, you end up kind of prematurely melting your heat shrink on one end, you know how big of a pain in the butt that is. So it is soldered nonetheless. So you can see what we've got here. This entire section is now completely repaired uh, and covered with some fresh uh, insulation. I know what you might be thinking, David, you just put solder on an engine. Well, listen, my thinking with that is the, the particular solder I used has a melting point of right around 365 degrees Fahrenheit. The engine room fan for a hot engine room kicks on at 85 Celsius. What is that in Fahrenheit? I don't know, 180 something maybe. So therefore my thinking is air temperatures in the engine room maybe get to like 250 sometimes if you like come off a track shut your car off and park right away. You know, you've got your exhaust heat kind of coming up into the, into the top of the engine room there. But my thinking is there's no way with air temperatures that we could possibly melt that solder. Uh, but I did, I did have that thought. And I really, really tried to depin that because it would have been so much easier. It would have avoided having to cut that wire and re-solder it. I just didn't want to risk breaking my connector and having even uh, bigger problems as a result. Anyway, I just spent way too much time talking about soldering a freaking wire. Let's get back to reassembling all of the auxiliary stuff on this engine. Well, friends, and just like that, this engine is officially ready to be made it up to the transmission and put back in that car. We're getting close. And I hope you're as excited as I am because seriously, this is big. This is big. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and call it here for today. We did a lot. Think about it at the beginning of this episode, there was nothing inside of our cylinder heads. We just had a long block. And now we have two completely assembled, completely timed, perfectly timed, mind you, cylinder heads and all of the auxiliaries back on this engine. So if you enjoyed this episode, please do me a huge favor and hit that like button. I tried my best to be as informative as possible as I went along to touch on the detailed steps so that if you ever choose to do this to your car, you can do this and, uh, and have the information at your fingertips. So if you like that aspect of it, please do me a huge favor and hit that like button. And if you have any questions or want clarification on anything, as always, feel free to drop them in the comments below. I do my best to respond in a very timely manner. In the next episode, we're gonna go ahead and tackle all that's left to do before putting this back up in the car, and then we're gonna do just that. And then we're gonna do the first start. So you're absolutely not gonna to wanna to miss that. Thank you all so much for being here today. I really appreciate each and every one of you. Yes, you, I'm looking right at you, and I will hopefully see you all in the next episode. Thanks. Oh, hey everyone, just a quick reminder, super high quality Fun Ahead TV merch is available on funaheadtv.com right now. So head on over to funaheadtv.com and get yourself some today. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Also, thanks so much for watching that video. If you want to see even more great Fun Ahead TV content, please click the link right here. I'll see you over there.